today. <laughs> Tomorrow you never know what will happen. Maybe they will close the university. I am, I am being a little bit... Uh... <laughs> anyway. <laughs> okay. Yes, I've known Osip for, I don't know, 20 years or something like that. And he always said, oh, come visit me in Barcelona. So I show up today, <laughs> the day before the revolution. <laughs> and uh, I'm not sure where I'm sleeping tonight or if the airport will even be open uh, on Monday or maybe I'll be here for many years. <laughs> Anyway, not knowing so much about the audience, how many of you are basically familiar with uh, the MODIS satellite at all? I, I, I need to understand if that's something most of you, about half of you, so uh, half of you don't know what that is. All right, that's important for me to know. Um, and that's all right, let's see. I'll probably go over the edge here at some point. <laughs> um, I, y with this seminar, I'm not going to talk in detail about our satellite algorithm. I'm, I'm going to spend more time trying to show how I am using the satellite data set to ask some bigger global ecology questions. So I hope even if you haven't heard of MODIS, hopefully that won't matter because um, these are questions that we want to answer in global ecology anyway. And MODIS just happens to be a data set I see of high value and that I'm familiar with. So um, the title is Terrestrial Net Primary Production of Planetary Boundary. Oh, okay, so my next quiz. Uh, to help me understand uh, how many of you heard of this concept of planetary boundaries? Okay, about half uh, also. Okay, so I'll work on that part too. So, um, and I'll start at the beginning. And so, um, this was the very first computer model of the Earth system ever done. And it was, uh, it was a collaboration between uh, MIT and I, I, I think a university in Italy. And um, the title really says it all, uh, The Limits to Growth. I was an undergraduate when it came out. You, you see that I paid $2.75 for this. This is my most valued book in my library to me because it, it was such a landmark uh, book. They tried to, with, you can't believe how primitive the computers were back then. I mean, your wristwatch has a bigger computer than university computers were at the time. And so this was an effort with a, just a tiny little computer to understand the largest interactions and dynamics of the whole Earth system. And um, basically, they broke the Earth system down into some kind of uh, logical but very aggregate components. Uh, food, pollution, population, resources. There is no geographic reference at all this was just food for the whole world, not food for Spain and food for you. Their geographic data sets had not yet been invented. And so this was this simple lump of these, of these uh, attributes of the Earth system put together with some of the basic dynamics. And the interesting thing, in 1972, was that their model showed that by right about now, things would be peaking. We would be reaching a point of, you might say, global saturation in a number of things. And so they, they projected this in 1972. Um, they've revisited 
this concept um, about the limits to growth. I, I guess I should say before I move on on this, at the risk of uh, probably, are there any economists here? Oh good, so I can say what I want. Um, <laughs> the economists all said this is crazy. You know how the economist logic goes. If there's a shortage of any material, the price goes up, you go find more, the price goes down with supply and demand and everything evens out and everyone's happy. And so the economists back at this time said this, this book was just trash. This was just ecologist, uh, you know, tree huggers. We like to call them in America. This is a bunch of tree huggers. And so this was widely criticized. Now, we fast forward to today's world. And um, this has been looked at again. Uh, the, the model runs from 1972 with this tiny little model. Um, and in 2009, um, a, um, a group of very eminent global scientists led by Johan Rockström from the Stockholm Resilience Institute uh, published a paper in Nature called Planetary Boundaries. And they postulated that there were a number of critical attributes of the Earth system, and they sound familiar to all of us, uh, climate change, ocean acidification, uh, ozone depletion, uh, we read upside down, phosphorus cycle, uh, in fresh water use, atmospheric aerosols, chemical pollution not yet quantified, but they wrote this very nice conceptual paper that said, gee, there might be boundaries to the planet. Uh, that if we exceed these boundaries, there, it's, it's going to have a backlash somehow. Um, well, I was old enough to say, wait a minute, doesn't this sound a lot like limits to growth from 1972 repackaged? But that's all right. All, very few people remember the 1972 book, but many people were, were quite engaged by this. And what's most important is it wasn't just scientists. The politicians and the policymakers, for some reason, um, can understand and relate to this framing of our global ecological issues uh, in a way that they, everything else we write, they pay no attention to. And so I've written many international documents, not one politician ever cites them or looks at them at all, and yet they were looking at planetary boundaries. And so this seemed like an important new framing for an idea that started with limits to growth. Okay, now let's go to my data set. And when I started, this is what we knew about global net primary production. I find this almost comical to look at. This was from a 1983 symposium in Bern, Switzerland. We, we had no global data sets at all yet. We had no georeference data sets at all. And so this was, in effect, a translation of climate data into presumed plant production. And this, is, this is the best we knew. Um, I was just finishing, or just starting my professorship, assistant professorship, and was invited to some meetings with NASA. And um, I had been doing computer modeling of uh, primitive modeling of, of forests for at 82 to 99, and this shows geographically where it appeared these areas had higher, um, higher um, or positive trends of NPP over the 18 years. And so uh, this was really a first paper to have ever even tried to show this, so as I say, got in Science Magazine. Uh, we can do this every year for, this is an example for the 
our national climate assessment for the US, but you could do this for Spain anytime you want. Uh, you can look every single year and see where the big drought areas are and where it was a good year and a bad year and everything in between. And so this gives you both a geographic data set across the entire country, but it also gives you a time series data set through the entire uh, growing season and dormant season. And uh, this data sets now, it began in the year 2000 and continues to this day. So this is about 17 years long now. Uh, over the years, after we got, so we uh, simply producing the data set was no longer a big challenge. The NASA computers uh, do all the work while I sit and have a cerveza. Um, we started trying to uh, uh, interpret more of, of what, is, what is causing the dynamics of this data set. In one paper, we found that the big La Nina year of 2011 was primarily, was also the highest global NPP we'd ever computed. And it turned out that it wasn't a big burst of growth in the Amazon, the way people are obsessed with the Amazon. It turned out to be in semi-arid savannas where all this extra rainfall actually was uh, providing uh, enhanced plant growth on a worldwide basis. So it really showed an interesting connection between large-scale atmospheric dynamics and biospheric response. Um, and Anna Bastos uh, from Portugal was the, some of you might know her, she was the, uh, at my lab and, and did this uh, paper uh, in 2013. Now, going to the global carbon numbers and starting to transition from, you might say, prior science to science policy, we know this is what um, carbon emissions uh, have been doing over the last 20 years. This is on a global basis, uh, the carbon emissions. Uh, we also look at trying to understand where do these emissions go in the Earth system. We now know that uh, the CO2 emissions, 91% are from fossil fuels, the other 9% are from deforestation and fires and, and things like that. We know that 44% stay in the atmosphere, about 26 are dissolved into the ocean and of course this is my box right here that I it's my job is to understand the 31 percent of carbon emissions that are absorbed by the terrestrial biosphere. So we've put together our global NPP record over now it's getting to be 35 years long and, and of course everybody tried to see is that going, it's certainly not going down. Does that look like it's going up? It might be going up. Um, and I finally realized maybe trying to see the subtleties of that trend is not the most interesting question. Maybe a more interesting question is that here the global NPP stays within very small annual amplitude, only about 2%. About one petagram is the annual amplitude of, of variability. And I thought, geez, I wonder if that's more significant that NPP on a global basis hardly changes at all. You might have a real bad year in Spain, but if you have a bad year in Spain, somewhere else is having a good year. If that's true, that's worth knowing right there in, in itself. So I got curious about this and said, well, how stable are our standard inputs to plant to global NPP. And of course, the sun is pretty stable. The interannual variability of solar input is like 0.1%. So we can think of that as being a fairly constant input to our uh, global analysis. It turns out, and maybe there's somebody in this audience that has updated data, it turns out on a global basis, we think rainfall, rain and snowfall, is roughly the same. And here again, when it rains like mad one place, somewhere else is having a drought. And that it all seems to pretty well balance out. And I would love a global hydrologist to challenge and, and test this idea some more. Because here again, it's pretty darn 
significant to our understanding of, of global scale science if that's true. It appears to be true to at least the first order. Now the one thing that's not staying stable of course is atmospheric CO2 which is the background of every photosynthesis model. So there have been a number of looks from the satellite record um, trying to answer this question in various pieces. So here in, in one of the Nature magazines just about a year ago um, was this is four different types of satellite data computed and processed in different ways. We won't go through the details. The slope of all of these is a little bit positive. So that means they're suggesting that there is a little bit of an upward trend in um, greening of the earth as they call it. Another paper um, just a year or so ago uh, look, putting together satellite data, flux net based model runs, and uh, CO, uh, CO2 um, flask data inversion runs, all of them have the same upward trend. Now if Probably not too many of, of you are carbon cycle specialists and, and this is part of the reason why. There's very important but very subtle differences between GPP, which is gross primary production, basically daily photosynthesis, net primary production at the end of the year, which subtracts respiration costs to the living plants, and then finally net ecosystem exchange, which is the final CO2 exchange of the entire ecosystem. Each of those are important but have to be interpreted in different ways. And if, and if you don't sit and live and breathe carbon science all the time, you go crazy trying to keep this straight. And so all of these papers are answering part of the question in different ways, and yet they're all important. Um, one of these that uh, uh, published with uh, one of my colleagues at my university um, suggests that the big difference has not been increasing photosynthesis but declining respiration in the, in the plants. And so here's where the complications start that we're trying to understand. Of Additional importance, this was one of my last PhD students, we looked at the big GCMs, the big climate models that project the two and three degree warming to the end of the century that are in the news all the time, they're being quoted. Well deep inside those climate models is a land CO2 balance model. And if the land takes up more CO2, then the atmosphere goes up slower and if the land takes up less, it goes up faster. So this is a big deal in these climate models. Well, we found that over the period that we had satellite data here, that the models were basically about three times overstating what they call the CO2 fertilization effect. So we think these models were being too enthusiastic about greening the biosphere faster than we are actually seeing. And so this, uh, this paper was just a, yeah, just a year ago and it was really a, a kind of a call out to the climate modeling groups to pay attention to these algorithms. So let's go back to the planetary boundaries now. And uh, one of the things they did not propose in 2009 was any carbon cycle variable, which I find amazing, it's, uh, but they didn't. And so uh, with all the other variables they define, they, there is no carbon cycle variable. So this is uh, when I, I wrote a paper um, a few years ago and basically argued that there's about five of these that are related to plant production uh, collectively and maybe that NPP would be a valuable planetary boundary in its own right. So I had a paper, an invited paper in science to make this argument of that here's a planetary boundary for the biosphere that actually had a, as a data set available to test. And uh, I basically I, I won't go through all the uh, pieces here as so much as to say that we currently think that humans are appropriating of something like 40% of global 
plant production. And that we aren't eating all that. Some of it is the cows that eat it and then we eat the cows and eat the cheese. Uh, some of it is fuel, some of it is building, it's all of our consumption of plant material in uh, collection, uh, collectively. Well, if we use 40% right now, that kind of implies we got lots to spare. That, gee, there must be 60% still left. Well, in this paper, I looked more deeply and found out that turns out a lot of that other 60% really is not harvestable, even if we wanted to. It's, uh, it, you know, it's, it's boreal forest high up in Siberia, for example, and places where you would take more energy to get the material than you'd get back. So they really are not available. I calculate that we have about 10% about 10% of global NPP remaining that humanity has, has to, to work with if we choose. And so you can read how I go through this in this paper if you want. And so what I argue there, and I guess is the basis of what I'm uh, suggesting today, is, is this net primary production a data set is valuable for us understanding climate stabilization. It's valuable for bioenergy policy, which I'm going to show you in a minute. Food security, which I'm also going to show you in a minute. And I've already talked about terrestrial carbon source sink dynamics. So it seems to have some value inherently uh, as, as one of these planetary boundaries. And, and of course, from a very policy point of view, I can restate this in a more direct way and say, well, is our current consumption of the terrestrial biosphere sustainable? So let's use the last few minutes here and see if that, if we can answer that question in, uh, in any kind of a solid way. Uh, the first thing we have to remember, of course, is global population is not stabilizing yet. Uh, we used to think that we were going to asymptote at about 9 billion people in 2050. A paper out of the United Nations only about two years ago said it might be 11 billion that we have by the year 2100. So the, the real critical point is we don't know how big the global population will get, but we know it's going to be bigger than now by at least a few billion. The second principle that I worry about, since I, I kind of half do hydrology, is everywhere we look in the world, dry areas, dry agricultural areas are running out of water. And I have a whole other lecture that I do on global water supplies and droughts. And um, we know that big places in India, certainly a whole lot of the central southern central plains of the U.S., they're draining the groundwater and once it's gone, it's, it's, it's all over. And uh, you can see this all over the world. So I'm not sure if we can expand the amount of irrigated agriculture. We'll be lucky to sustain what we have on a global basis. When we think about fertilizer use, there's a number of parts of the world that are actually being over-fertilized and highly efficient fertilizer techniques would make a big difference. Uh, Africa particularly is, uh, their crop development is under-fertilized, but the, the potential for more efficient fertilizer use is really large everywhere and we're generating tremendous water pollution with the current fertilizer, fer fertilizer use we have. Now looking to what you, some of the ag food security studies, uh, this particular one shows, these are, we'll just look at the global pattern here, not the, the different continents. This is up to the point of the paper. The, the only important thing to see is they see it going down. This is the per capita food production for the world. They project it to be going down nut up and not even staying stable. Here's another one. Um, they they uh, look more specifically at four different crops and the same thing, the same principle, the solid line is the, pro the projected um, crop harvests 
and production and the dotted line are the demand. And in all four of these, they see demand exceeding supply uh, for these. And I could go, I've got lots of other papers, and this seems to be a common theme in the global food security world, is that uh, in terms of just pure food production, it isn't going to get any better than the way we have it now, and we have more people coming all the time. And so that then brings some other interesting policy questions. Uh, this is a big one on ethanol. Um, and it basically argues, well, if, if we're looking forward to future potential food sh shortages, how smart is it to build an industry around growing maize and then turning it into ethanol? That doesn't sound very bright. And um, so I looked into some of the bioenergy literature and certainly not anything that my lab had specialized in and so here's an example of these papers this runs out to 2100 and we'll just look at bioenergy and this green wedge appropriate color is what they these are economists so I get to say mean things about economists because none of them are here uh, this is what they think they can count on from bioenergy in the, uh, the year uh, 2100. Uh, remember 425 exajoules. Remember that number. Um, we looked at a number of other current gross global bioenergy capacities with this. And so these are a whole bunch of papers. The world currently uses about 500 exajoules of total energy. Um, there were papers suggesting as high as 1,500 exajoules of energy could be gotten from bioenergy sources. It never occurred to them to look at the one global data set in the world that actually measures annual plant growth. I mean, that's what we do. Did they ever take a look to see if these were even possible? No, but we did. And guess what? I'll get you right to the bottom line. We don't see anything above about 100 exajoules as being possible. Remember, 400 exajoules and even higher were what the economists were projecting. Even to do 100 exajoules, we would have to be seriously growing and harvesting every spare uh, bit of, of biomass. Uh, worldwide. So even 100 exajoules is a big deal. And these numbers these economists were using are just absolutely moonbeam numbers. Uh, they're, they're the kind of thing Donald Trump would say. Um, and so they have no credibility at all and I wish these people would, these economists would read outside their field once in a while. When we published this in Bioscience, the editor of the journal even made that commentary uh, in that issue that, gee, maybe the energy economists need to be paying attention to this. And so um, we're clearly in what a lot of people call the Anthropocene era, where we as a as uh, species are dominating this planet in, in multiple ways. And uh, I, I always like this simple cartoon. It cuts past a lot of details and just uh, gives some examples of all the different metrics of growth that have occurred uh, with humanity over the last, say, 50 years. And the little and the little kid with the balloon says, geez, the world has, hasn't grown one bit. And you can't help but figure sometime we're going to be hitting limits to growth or planetary boundaries. And there's certainly some fairly good evidence that that time is, is uh, coming around right now. In a way, I, I almost feel ashamed for my generation that we're dumping this problem on all of you in graduate school now. Is, you know, we've floated along and left you with this and your generation has to do some really big things. And I don't know how you're going to do it, but I sure hope you get going quick. Because um, uh, we can't have 50 more years of the current, as, as the economists like to say, BAU, business as usual, is their favorite phrase. And uh, you should go to economist lectures and hammer away on them because they deserve it. It's amazing that they have models birthed 
models that don't define any kind of uh, biophysical constraint at all. The only constraint is money. How many euros can be generated somehow? And uh, that we really, as I guess ecologists, or as most of us here ecologists and biophysical scientists, we have to get engaged in this and not let them keep making these moonbeam, you know, 400 exajoule estimates for bioenergy and things like that, because uh, we can prove they're not possible from our own science and our own data, but if we don't get engaged in the policy battles, they're going to keep uh, and you know, talking this up to our political leaders and, and then just doing ridiculous things. I mean, this is, this is right out of the uh, latest IPCC report, and this is basically the emission trend up till now, carbon emission trends again, rescaled, and this, this is what the rest of the century looks like. And we could end up, this is the Donald Trump curve right here. Um, <laughs> This is probably the carbon cycle science curve right here. And people think this is noise and model error. It's not noise and model error. It's uncertainty in what humanity is going to decide to do. And it's collectively our decision to decide whether we end up here or here. I hope I live long enough to see what happens. And there's certainly when I have longer seminars, I give some of the new things that are coming that are certainly, so, certainly showing momentum that we didn't have 10 years ago. I just bought an electric car a couple months ago. That didn't even exist five years ago. Um, we're seeing solar panels and wind turbines just explode across the, the world. So there's some positive momentum, but boy, we need a lot more of it and quick. And we don't have time to take another 10 or 20 years and think about this. And I, I really try, I feel sorry for this younger generation that they're going to have to fight this battle, not just scientifically, but politically too. Uh, I never thought when I started in science that I would give public lectures to, you know, to the general public. I thought I'd give lectures like this to fellow academics, but public lectures and talks to politicians, I never thought. We, we all of us have to start doing that. It's, I'm sorry, that's just it. And uh, here's why. I find this intriguing. This is Earth from a billion kilometers away from the Voyager spacecraft. And uh, would you believe when I give public talks and especially after that movie a couple years ago, The Martian, people came up with a straight face and said, well, if things really get bad here, it looks like we could go to Mars. Go, oh, come on. It's 10,000 euros per kilo just to lift anything into near-Earth orbit. I mean, it is so impossible to even send a hundred people to Mars for one year, not a billion people to Mars forever. And yet people, it shows you how <sighs> disconnected some of the public can be on scientific logic. It just, you just go, and of course you can't do that in front of them. You have to go, well, that's a very good question. <laughs> even though it's a, a ridiculous idiot question. Um, but it, it shows how we have to, this is our job now. And uh, I wish you all to get right with it because we need it quick. So that's it, I'm already out of time. Thank you. If we go this way, probably we are also getting more and more scarce resources for to do things. Yeah. And probably, yeah. I don't know. I'm not sure if this is uh, uh, viable in terms of that before we collapse. Before yeah. Going this yeah. Way. Yeah. And I ag I agree that their early model showed kind of a gentle decline, but that's every bit of that was like a billion people dying. You go what? And I guess anything's possible.
as I go through these huge international airports, I imagine these giant pandemics that propagate over the entire planet in 48 hours, and I think it would start right here in Amsterdam Airport. <laughs> and so it's not impossible that we could add, but let's get past that. Um, the food part, I gave a very quick summary of here because I knew I, I couldn't take more time. A, a bigger answer to simply the food availability is that we still have a food surplus in the world right now, a pretty, pretty substantial one. Um, the best estimates are that a third to as high as 40% of the food grown ends up never being eaten in various ways. In the developing world, their lack of transport and uh, refrigeration, the food just spoils before somebody buys it and eats it. In the developed world, it's all the stores and restaurants that have food that don't, doesn't get eaten and is thrown out the back. And uh, so we have a huge potential to just use the food we grow more potentially, a really huge potential. And so I don't see that we're, the, those estimates of food production capacity looked quite ominous, but I actually think we have ways that we could deal with that for a number of decades before uh, things would really get serious. Thanks for a rousing talk. Um, but to continue on the food issue, because yeah. I agree, it's really important. It's really one of the most fundamental of all. Right. But I mean, if we're thinking about projecting it forward to 2100, if you imagine going backwards the same amount of time to 1934, yeah. Yeah. I mean, could you, I mean, you know, in 1934, you would have had no idea that the Green Revolution was around the corner. Like yeah. This, right? So, is yeah. It, like, are there, can you put some fundamental biophysical constraints on? I you think we're. Like, like I think building like tiered levitating fields. Yeah, know, those like, those cost a lot of money. People try them in on a small basis. Uh, Noah, <laughs> look, that, that's a good way to start the thought of the trajectory of food. Is start back a hundred years, and of course, what has come along? Huge use of fertilizer. A huge use of irrigation on our best land. We think with both of those we're pretty close to the top. The amount of arable land worldwide they figure peaked about 20 years ago. So it isn't like there's lots of good new land to find and I've already said we think our global use of fresh water is asymptoted also. Uh, the genetic improvement part of this, I've looked at, I'm not a genetics guy at all, for all the things you read about, they're making incremental improvements, one or two percent, not massive breakthroughs. And so I don't even see genetic improvement as being a substantial new, uh, new source. So I think our raw capacity is not very far from the top right now. When we do our models, it even decreases a little, a little percentage. And we will talk about this later. Now we do have progressing CO2 fertilization, which is real, and the scientists are seeing that in the field now, so that's a bit of good news. Some of that nitrogen deposition is free fertilizer in the native in natural landscapes, so we're getting some enhancement of the biosphere, but um, we're not getting enough that I see that it's going to train. I think the food waste issue has way more room for easy progress than increasing capacity. <coughs> questions? Meanwhile, let's, let's put a more technical one. Oh, those are ones I don't know any. Yeah, I, I forgot know. all that stuff. <laughs> I forgot all the yeah, hard I, stuff. You are wise. It's better to forget. But you know that this, this is discussed the way that Modi's MPP is calculated. Have you, have you thought about all this criticism to use MPP from motive model, assuming <laughs> that uh, all this efficiency yep. is just a yep. of BPD and temperature and not other drivers? Or? 
So is there any, any step forward on, on that issue? Um, yeah, I've read lots of criticisms, probably written by you anonymously. <laughs> <laughs> Anonymous referee number two. <laughs> you know, you know, a young kind guy. <laughs> um, I guess certainly we've looked hard at the respiration calculation and um, probably the biggest problem we have is our calculation has to fit into the entire modus land processing stream. So, for example, we only have biome definitions that the land cover team provides. And we, we can't really just make up our own. Um, we only have the LAI FPAR that Mod 15 provides. And so we're constrained in the production world from doing anything very different at the moment. The other thing you have to understand um, programmatically is NASA sees this as an end of mission. They don't want to spend a lot more money on MODIS. They want it to just glide to the finish line. And so they really don't want me to do anything new and, and, uh, and uh, um, you know, a big advance. Now I can on the side be working on new algorithms for the next generation of sensors. But I think the MODIS algorithm to the end of MODIS is not going to change hardly at all. And it's primarily because uh, we've got to keep stability of the algorithm. Um, and at the very end of a 20 year mission is, is when the stability is more important. Okay, yeah. More questions? What about the mismatch? Sorry, Matt, yeah, please. So, we try to challenge you, let's see. So, if we shift the technology from one to another, let's say, oil to uh, electric, probably we will discover that there are other resources that are also limited, like uh, metals for batteries or whatever, that can be limiting the alternative, uh, the alternative mm -hmm. to the current business. <laughs> Then uh, I have a thought that uh, I don't have the answer. Which is better? To reach the limit because we are spending too much per capita, so we still can increase. Mm -hmm. To reach the limit because we are just spending the minimum per capita, but we are too much people. Yeah, we've just overloaded the planet in every way. So which is better? <laughs> yeah, which is better? To get, yeah. to realize that we are spending too much or too much people. Yeah. The, the too much people. Right. Yeah. The too much people. It, it's kind of uh, funny that I study this because I come from a state with some of the l smallest population in the whole world. <laughs> mm. And uh, we have a population of, I think, two per square kilometer <laughs> in my state. <laughs> But then whenever I fly to Asia, I look down in the plane and I go, oh, now I get it. Now I know what 2,000 per square kilometer looks like. Um, we aren't going to run out of just raw space. It really is more going to be a function of uh, both quality of life and, and equitable distribution. And as I say, right now there's a global food surplus and yet there's hundreds of millions of people starving. And it's all because of war and civil unrest. It's not because there's no food. And so w one thing we have to separate is what are our biophysical constraints versus what are social and political constraints and make sure we're solving the correct problem when we are addressing them. And I mean the world could hold 11 billion people if it had to. I think I'd stay in Montana but uh, we could, they would fit on the planet but it might be at a pretty degraded pop, uh, uh, quality of life in a lot of places. Questions? Uh, let's ask another technical one. The last one, because otherwise it seems that we are worried only about uh, <laughs> the space. 
And I'm talking, I'm talking to like economists or something. <laughs> That's right. Uh, but what about, uh, uh, what do you think, why there is such a mismatch between uh, your modest data and the eco values tower data? Well, to start with, two things. First, the flux tower data is calculating and an instantaneous GPP and then a longer term NEE, I'm computing an NPP. And uh, there's no doubt that that heterotrophic respiration term is quite variable and in different biome types it's a much bigger, smaller part of the carbon balance. And there's, I've never thought up a logic of that I, I could try to do a global NEE that would uh, past peer review. And so I could always crunch some numbers, but I think the assumptions I would have to make, you know, about every tropical forest has a below ground carbon content of 30% or something like that would be so ridiculous that it, it would it'd just be a mathematical exercise, not a scientific one. Um, the other thing that I, I never forget is that a tower has a footprint and our modus has a square kilometer and it sees everything in that square kilometer. It sees your tower but it also sees your truck next to the tower and it sees the road and it sees the entire scene and attempts to compute an NPP. Whereas with your tower you're, you're getting a more pure signal of the CO2 balance. And uh, in wide open wilderness, that might not be a big deal, but I've been to lots of towers that I look at the tower and I just go, oh my God. The Duke Tower, one of the more famous ones, has an eight lane freeway only about two kilometers away. And so uh, there's quite a mismatch in, in the system scaling on top of there being a mismatch in the carbon components. And so whenever we tune our algorithm to perfection on a specific tower, we can do pretty well on that tower. But to have a generalized algorithm for the whole biome type, uh, which is what our job is, we, we as, as you've seen all too often, can be a long ways off uh, a fair... Even, even the towers, they have problems to hmm? close their budget. In addition to what you're saying, sure. they have uh, many, many problems. Well, yeah, they usually yeah, yeah. close their budget to about 80% or 85. Yeah, less, yes. yeah. and so, so we both have methodology uh, yeah. errors on our end of the problem. It's good to learn, good to learn from everybody. So Chavi has another question. What's your opinion about the role can play this new paradigm form uh, on the basis of the very recent uh, um, possibility of using the combination of Sentinel-2 and UNSAT. Uh, oh, yeah. Because uh, this offers us a, a, a CRISPR image of the Earth. Yeah. And you don't see the same things. Uh, yeah. I, of course, agree that some years ago, uh, approximations like the, the ones made uh, with ABHR or MODIS were yeah. the, the only one possible. Right. But nowadays, with yep. modern computers and yep. uh, those constellations, we can look at a... Global uh, Landsat has arrived. And yep. uh, which yeah. will be the, the role. Yeah, and I know some of my NASA friends are hot on that already, of using Landsat for your spatial detail and then using MODIS for your temporal se seasonality. And so those sort of merged uh, multi-sensor data sets are already in pursuit because we finally, it's only been five years, but we finally have a global data at 30 meter scale that's been processed uh, consistently. And so we, when I started one kilometer with MODIS really was the standard state of the art. And as we've gone through our, um, our mission, we got so like with the vegetation indices, 500 meters became the state of the art and to some extent in the 250 meter and so now I've seen this leap to, to 30 meters. What I find even crazier is there's a couple of companies 
that are, what are they calling them? These picosats. They're about the size of a basketball and they launch them by the dozens, like 30 and 40 at a time. They just throw into the sky and they figure that they, once everything's all organized, you will have one meter resolution anywhere on earth within something like four hours. Because there'll be so many hundreds of those up there that anywhere you want to see, there'll be one right over. And of course the processing of all that spaghetti Sounds hard, but they figured these out before, these processing hot dogs. So I'm sure we are only about 10 years away from global one meter all the time data. And so that's just where the global state of the art is going. This is why I have to retire. <laughs> <laughs> Going to more of the technical uh, issues. Uh, when you, you have this uh, information from bodies and you want to transfer to eco you know, e ecological variables, but you have to transform the information and to check the uncertainty related to it. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and this is, I think, is one of the criticisms that sometimes your, your work has been receiving. Yeah. These uncertainties. What is the, the situation now? Right? Well, the, the, to me, the most immediate and addressable uncertainty is that we have these only eight defined biomes worldwide and all of the physiological parameters are constant for every evergreen needle leaf forest in the world has the same maximum epsilon even though we know better. I've already thought through a um, a processing logic that would not change the number of biomes but would add an additional GS reference data layer where I could de define uh, E maxes within a biome type to a, a very wide range from you know boreal forests down to tropical forest and give them a much more refined epsilon maximum from this uh, GIA reference database. I might get that into our last processing of the, NAT, of the MODIS data set. Uh, as I say, NASA is actually discouraging us from doing anything uh, very new. I might end up doing it offline, it's just a data product of my own lab, and then I'll sell it and get rich. <laughs> That's never worked before, I'm sure it won't be now. But, whether I can, I've thought this through for a couple of years. We're looking for the global principles of, uh, you know, the plant functional traits uh, that a number of groups are, are working towards. And I think that would be an easy intermediate step without doing any new absolute algorithm uh, you know, stepping into anything like a PRI, that uh, I think this would be an e intermediate step of complexity that would fit within the current processing. You should do that. I know I should. I might go home and do it. Um. <laughs> anyway, so if there are no more questions, please remind that uh, Steve Running is available for the slots of 20 minutes. <laughs> one of you. Ah, we are very professional. We are like in the big universities, 20 minutes with each one of the postdocs. Or the only rule is they have to bring me a cerveza. Yes, of course. Of course. <laughs> and we will do that, uh, as I said today, because we, tomorrow it seems that this will be closed, right? Well, I don't know it's Saudi, but uh, tomorrow it's, it's possible that uh, you cannot come here. Okay? So please do it today. If there is, uh, if there are many, many people, then we will decide what to do. Maybe we can try You can meet me at a pub tomorrow. I'm here. Tomorrow. I'm somewhere tomorrow, just not officially. Take, take advantage of that because not always we have the opportunity of having part of the history of science. Most of <laughs> started with him, and most is dying with him. <laughs> 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 Yeah. Ah.